Will you please pray with me? God, we ask that it is you that we hear and feel in these words and in this place. Please help us to make church not about ourselves. Amen. So very quickly, I want to tell you how the rest of this series is going to play out because today we're doing chapter 3. Next week, we're actually going to take a break from the book. So if you haven't gotten caught up on all your reading, you'll be able to next week. So next week, there, we will not be doing a chapter here. We'll take a break from it. But the following week is where it gets a little crazy, but it's going to be exciting because we're actually going to skip chapter 4 and do chapter 5 first. And then we're going to go back to chapter 4, and then we'll close the book off with chapter 6. Did you hear that? So next week, no chapter. The following week is what? And then? And then? Awesome. So you'll all have those read and we'll be ready to go. Now, a number of you know this about me. Maybe not all of you, but a number of you do. When I was in high school, I wanted to be a doctor. And so out of high school, right as a senior year, I applied to med school. There was like this advanced track system, and I was accepted into med school. And I was going to go, and I was going to be a doctor. And my um, family physician encouraged me not to go through the fast track, but instead go to a four-year college and do pre-med that way. Enjoy your college time. Don't crunch your college, your undergrad, down into two years to do this fast track. And so I followed his advice, and I went, and I did that. And I was at first a chemistry major, and then I became... A the first class of neuroscience majors at Hiram College. And I was going to go and be a doctor. That's what I wanted. I knew that that's what I was supposed to do, and that's what I wanted. Several years ago, my family was out to eat. My nephew was around four years old, and he wanted something or other. I don't really remember exactly what he wanted, while we were all eating, but he didn't get his way, and so he did what a lot of four-year-olds do. He threw a huge tantrum in this restaurant. He began crying and screaming, and I had had enough, and so I took him and I put him in the van outside, and I told him that we weren't going to leave the van until he was done screaming. Well, he thought I was bluffing. And so we sat there, and he screamed, and he screamed, and he screamed, and I ignored him. Our entire dinner was stalled because of his tantrum. Kids do these things, right? Adults do these things too. There are moments in all of our lives where we want everything to be about us. And when it's not, when our schedule gets messed up, or the most common one is when someone cuts us, this happened to me just yesterday, when someone cuts us off, we throw a tantrum. Tara had to tell me to calm down. We can throw tantrums as well. And the hard part is determining when it's okay to push for our preferences and when we need to step back and serve a greater good and not serve ourselves. That's the hardest part, figuring out which we're supposed to do. Jesus tells his followers... If anyone wants to be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. There's a slide for that one. There we go. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. This is one way where Jesus puts other over self. And that's a good model for church membership, putting other over self. We come together to praise God, give thanks for all of our blessings, and to serve others in our quest for God's will being done on earth. That's what we pray every week. Your will be done. But how? By serving others, we can be working towards God's will being done. At the last church I served, I had an elderly woman speak to me once about her grandchild. She came up to me and she said that her grandchild was absolutely crazy. He was wild. He would scream. He would cry. He would throw tantrums. He, never was, he would never behave himself. He would destroy anything within arm's reach. And he was all around cantankerous and ornery, just completely crazy. And he was only 11. And she told me all this because she said, if only he would be baptized, then he would be okay. Okay. 
I'm not quite sure that's how that works. I guess in her mind, all that was missing for her grandchild was him saying some words, a dunk in some water, and he'd suddenly stop being so childish. I don't think she ever took the time to really look around a church. Because if she did, she'd see an awful lot of people who have said a statement of faith, who have been dunked in some water, but who can still act pretty childish. But for some reason, she thought that's all that was missing. Rainer opens up this third chapter by saying, quote, Christians can sometimes act just like those demanding children who want things their way. Temper tantrums in churches may not include church members lying on the floor kicking and screaming, but some come close. But the strange thing about church membership is that you actually give up your preferences when you join. Don't get me wrong. There may be much about your church that you like a lot, but you are there to meet the needs of others. You are there to serve others. You are there to give. You are there to sacrifice. If we're supposed to be here to serve others, then I feel like it's necessary for us to look at those words, serve and servant. Rainer points out serving and, servant and service are important to our faiths, and he says, the word servant appears 57 times in the New Testament, and serve occurs 58 times. That's a lot of times, actually. It might not seem like that much, but that's a lot of times. But what I thought about is that Rainer and many theologians and many translators, they actually downplay this word. So I want you to stick with me for a minute because we're going to do a little Greek study. In the Greek New Testament, there are two words that are translated as servant. The first is diakonos and the second is doulos. So diakonos is a compound word of dia, which means thoroughly, and konos, which means dust. Thoroughly dust. This word is translated as servant, minister, deacon, or deaconess, and it gets this translation because the word is meant to imply moving somewhere and doing something with such speed and veracity that dust is flying up behind you. A servant in this sense is always active. A diakonos, which sounds a lot like the diaconate, right? Deacons and deaconesses is always active, is thoroughly dust, is doing so much work for God that earth is flying up around them. The second word that's translated as servant is doulos, and a more accurate translation of this, and the most literal, is slave. We pretty it up in our, in our Bibles. It means slave. But it's hard for us in our world to understand the kind of bondage that our faith asks of us. It asks for us to completely surrender our will to God. God alone is our master, not our checkbooks, not the gas pump, not our cars, not our possessions, nothing but God is our master. So if we claim to be a servant, then we should be a slave to God, and a slave serves without any kind of payment expected. So if the only reason you're here is so that you can have some kind of ultimate reward later, that's not the kind of servant that God calls for us to be. We should serve without the expectation for God to give to us because we've served. So one last Greek word I want to do and that is latreo. And this gets translated as to serve. But the best definition is to worship. Because latreo means to serve in something for which you were designed. And we are all designed to serve through worship. By looking more closely at the word servant and this word serve, we can see that it's more than just saying that we're following God. It's more than just showing up to church. It's more than just giving some money or some time. If we are servants, 
then we are all slaves to God, not in the sense that God owns us, but in the sense that we serve God always without any expectation for payment in return. If we are servants, then we are all ministers. If we are servants, then we all want to run out and do God's ministry. If we serve God, then we worship God every day, not just Sunday. We lose a little bit of something in our translation because all we get is servant and serve, but there's a lot more going on in those words. In our Mark reading from earlier, we saw that Jesus tells us to be servants or slaves to all. And in Ephesians 3, 7, Paul tells us that he became a slave to God. He says, I was made a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. I was made a slave of this gospel, of this by the gift of God's grace. God's grace, mercy, forgiveness, love, all of God's being is graciousness to us. And God's grace gifted Paul with the chance to serve. And we are called to do likewise. Rayner expounds on the servant motif a little bit when he writes, we will never find joy in church membership when we are constantly seeking things our way. Have you noticed that yet? If we always want it our way, we're never happy because it's never really our way. We will never find joy in church membership when we are constantly seeking things our way. But paradoxically, we will find the greatest joy when we choose to be last. That's what Jesus meant when he said the last will be first. True joy means giving up our rights and preferences and serving everyone else. Now, when I first read this statement, if you look in my, in my copy, there's a big question mark next to this because I was thinking, what does he mean by there's true joy in being last? Nobody likes to be at the end of the line. What does he mean? So I, I really thought about it and I was thinking, how do you find true joy in it? It really is paradoxical. How can I find true joy if I'm putting my preferences behind, behind me so I can serve others? What if that serving is uncomfortable? What if that serving is out of my way? What if that serving is just weird to me? And then I remembered Brother Andrew. Are any of you familiar with Brother Andrew? One person, Daryl. Well, you all have some reading to do. <laughs> Andrew Vanderbilt is a Dutch missionary who was affected by the religious persecution that he saw during World War II and the subsequent anti-religious regimes that existed in Eastern Europe and Asia. And it was during the era of the Iron Curtain that Andrew felt the call to serve God and he started illegally smuggling Bibles into countries where Christianity was illegal. He traveled the world serving God and he was eventually nicknamed God's Smuggler and his first book has that same title, God's Smuggler. And in his books, Andrew writes again and again about God being present in his interactions while serving others and how much joy that would bring him and others. There's one story in particular where he's, he's finding this church, this hidden church in Eastern Europe. It's part of the, the Soviet Union at the time and, and he finds it and they're basically all hiding for their lives while they're worshiping and he writes about the joy of God being present in that moment. That's weird to us. We don't have to hide. We choose to hide a lot. We don't have to hide. And he has been taken out of his comfort zone and he's traveled so far and he's gone to this place that's foreign to him. And by putting others first and himself last, he finds his greatest joy. He went out of his way to serve are we members who truly desire to serve God? Or are we members who desire to serve only self? Rainer and some others went and they interviewed some churches who were largely self-serving. Another way he could have labeled this, and if you read other books on this, this is how it would be labeled. He went and interviewed churches that are dying. 
that are largely self-serving, and they came up with 10 dominant behavior patterns that these churches exhibited. And these 10 patterns are what kept them from being God's servants. And so we're going to look at these 10 patterns, and I want us to see if we find ourselves in any of these patterns. And they are worship wars, prolonged minutia meetings, facility focus, program-driven, an inwardly focused budget, inordinate demands for pastoral care, attitudes of entitlement, greater concern about change than the gospel, anger and hostility, and evangelistic apathy. Did you find yourself in any of these ten? Don't think about anyone else. Don't think, oh, I see so-and-so up there. Just ask yourself if these behaviors get in the way of you serving God. Do they? Now let's back up a bit. Do you find our church in any of these behaviors? I'm going to be brutally honest here in a second. Do you find our church in any of these behaviors? I read through this section many times trying to figure out where we are. And I would say that I can see us in four of these pretty routinely. And another three we kind of go in and out of. But I'm fairly critical though. Because I want us to move out of all ten of these. I want us to be able to look at this list and say we need to pray for churches that are having these issues. Because they're behind us. So how do we get away from these behaviors? We have to look at the root cause. And we all get stuck in these because we want church to be about us. Whether we know it or not, we want church to be about us. And we all get stuck in that and we all have these inner monologues, things like, well, that's not how I would have done it. I'm not working with him because he never listens to me. I'm not going to help her because she always does it her own way. We are serving ourselves, so we need to figure out how to stop doing that. Rayner writes, church membership from a biblical perspective is about servanthood. It's about giving. It's about putting others first. And Jesus is the greatest example of putting others first. We sang this morning, we'll never know the cost of our sin upon the cross. We'll never truly understand that. Jesus is the greatest example of putting others first in this really early church faith statement that's found in Philippians 2, 5 through 11 tells us how much Jesus was about serving others and how that should affect us. So in Philippians 2, we can read, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We, this faith statement begins with, we should be in the same mind as Christ. Our thoughts, our attitudes, our actions should mirror those of Christ. So what were his thoughts and actions? He gave of himself. He didn't have to. He chose to. He gave of himself by lowering his status and emptying himself into the form of a slave. He humbled himself. He was obedient in his service to God and to death and beyond. He even died a humiliating death for the sake of others. When we read and hear this passage, we shouldn't just be thinking about Christ. We should be asking ourselves, are we doing that? Are we following Christ's example 
and being good servants and great church members. Rayner says that we are to be servants, we are to be obedient, we are to put others first, we are to do whatever it takes to keep unity in our church. If we approach church membership from the perspective of entitlement, we have it upside down. You always ask first what you can do for the church. And we all have been blessed with gifts that we can give. I wanted to be a doctor. But that's what I wanted. I don't know if I would have found true joy in that. And I don't know if you all can ever understand the joy that I have being a part of your lives. Being there with you in the hospital, celebrating in your homes, getting to see a new baby. I don't know if I ever would have found that joy being a doctor. And halfway through my undergraduate experience, I felt a shift within me and I knew that I wasn't supposed to do that that I had a different calling that I needed to follow. And so I changed paths. But if you had met me in high school, I would have told you that I am going to be a doctor. If today you decide that you want to become the kind of servant that Jesus and Paul speak and write about, then I ask for you to take the third pledge with me. But know that, it is tough, that this is a tough pledge to take. It's easy to say the words, but it's much harder to live them because we're afraid that if we don't pursue our own desires, we won't be happy. But we should know that if we serve God, then we will all be very joyful in working toward the kingdom. So please stand and take this pledge if you no longer want the church to be about your desires and preferences. I will not let my church be about my preferences and desires. That is self-serving. I am a member in this church to serve others and to serve Christ. My Savior went to a cross for me. I can deal with any inconveniences and matters that just aren't my preference or style. Amen.